Welcome back to another episode of the Playful Creative Podcast, where we explore all the different ways people bring creativity and play into their daily lives. I'm your host, Sarah Moyle, and today I'm interviewing Mike Brennan, author of Daily Creative Habit. We'll discuss what it's like when having a creative job goes from feeling like play to feeling like work, and how creativity is a skill that can be lost as well as learned. Mike shares his journey of reconnecting with his artistic side through a daily challenge, which inspired him to create his own creativity journal and content, Daily Creative Habit. So no matter who you are, where you're from, or how you like to be creative or playful, we're glad you're here with us today on The Playful Creative. So welcome to the show, Mike. I'm so happy to have you on here. And thank you, Sarah. Um, yeah. I would love to just jump in by having you tell us a little bit about what it means to be a creator and a communicator telling stories on stages and pages. Yes, yes. That's my little soundbite that basically opens up the door to all the creative things that I do. Um, and so on the creator side, my background is graphic design. Uh, I went to art school for that and went into the field and it was doing that for many years in different um, types of organizations, large and small um, places where it was the big corporate beast, all the way down to the place where I was the art department. So I had a wealth of experiences as far as problem solving and design solutions. And um, I also do illustration. And so a lot of that is uh, born out of even my own interests and passion projects, uh, pop culture related and self-published books that I have. And so that stuff kind of is the creator side, along with some things like live event sketching that I do um, and really anything else that falls into that creator hat. Uh, some of the stuff is, again, more passion project oriented. And then on the communicator side, I speak. Uh, I go and speak at conferences and events and with teams about creativity and um, just the importance of establishing a daily creative habit, which I know we'll get into in a little bit, mm -hmm. but how creativity and in developing this habit really changed my life and how I believe it can change other people's lives as well. And so that comes through speaking, it comes through my own podcast, Creative Chats, it comes through resources that I created through daily creative habits. Um, as a brand and i've been writing more as well now too so there's a lot of things that go into the communicator side as well but all mm -hmm. these things are all centered around creativity my experience with creativity and how i want that to be a connection point for other people to invite them into a conversation and say you know in some way i'm creating something that helps you feel seen or helps identify something gives you words or gives you a picture that says, oh, yes, I feel that I've experienced that. Thank you for putting it that way, because now I can understand better uh, my experience in my context. Wonderful. That's so neat. And I know I know you do so many things and I'm really excited to talk about those with you. But I wanted to to say that one of the things I really admire about you as I've gotten to know you over the couple conversations we've had is your willingness to be open and vulnerable about your journey. And so I'm wondering if you'll if you'll share today a little bit about what how creative habit came to be and your kind of personal story and history around that. Yes. Uh so you know, I was pretty much like every creative kid, right? Where it was part of my background of creating greeting cards, giving to family members, seeing their faces light up and just knowing I could create something and have an impact on somebody else's life. And so from an early age, I knew this is something I want to do. And so set off on that track, like I said, graphic design, went into various different agencies and uh, organizations and, you know, eventually hit this wall where I felt like I was part of the machine and, um, you know, it was like, I don't know that I'm really enjoying what I just did and I'm moving on to the next deadline. And it wasn't that the work was bad. It wasn't that the people I was working with, were, you know, it was a bad environment or anything like that. It was all great. But this nagging question of like, is this it? Because this shouldn't feel like it's it. And that caused me to kind of re-examine some things that were happening in my life at that moment. And I had some 
outside of work um, activities that were more people oriented, um, where it was very obvious that I was helping people in a very tangible way. And so I decided to kind of shift gears in my career and went into full time ministry for about 10 years. It's a whole other story, whole other chapter of my life. But through those years, I didn't do anything creative whatsoever, really, because it was more about building the organization um, and helping establish volunteers and structures and systems and uh, a lot of admin, which honestly is not in my gifting. Mm -hmm. And eventually came to this place where I realized, you know, I'm not doing anything even personally for my creativity because there's always something else to do. There's always more responsibilities. And that really started to wear on me more than I would have ever thought. And it's kind of like when you deny yourself of who you really are, you have this crisis. And whether it's happening consciously or unconsciously, it's going to happen. And so I started to suffer from depression. Um, and there were a, a few other factors in the mix there as well. Um, but, you know, I remember someone coming to me and saying, Mike, you know, I think you're depressed. And I was like, I don't understand what you're talking about. Like, I don't have time to be depressed. Like, I'm not <laughs> laying on the couch. I'm not like just a sad sack or whatever. But I yeah. knew that emotionally I was distraught and I, I felt like the knotted up ball of twine mm -hmm. and I couldn't find the edges. And it really bothered me because I always prided myself on being very self-aware and being able to kind of talk myself through some things and uh -huh. figure some things out. And I was at this point where I'm like, I can't do this and I don't even know how to begin. And so that was the that ushered in a series uh, of events that were really rock bottom for me i ended up having to leave uh, that job and that career i had to leave uh, sell a home i had to move uh, and then in the midst of that my father passed away from cancer very quickly mm. and so it was at this place where i'm going you know how did life come to this like this isn't how things are supposed to be um and it was then that i was seeking to get some help with you know mental health and then in the midst of that I, I remember just hearing this voice inside going come back to your art come back to your creativity because at one time it brought you joy you know there was a moment where in your childhood you realized oh this really lights me up and i enjoy this and it wasn't tied to clients it wasn't tied to money it wasn't tied to anything else that we end up shackling our creativity with a lot of times and i thought you know i don't even know if it's possible for me to get back to that place um, i hadn't done anything in 10 years and so what makes me think i could just kind of pop back into it now right mm -hmm. and so that led me to uh, a series of of things where I was introduced to this idea of a 365 day art making journey. How cool. And I was both intrigued and terrified because I thought, well, this could really be something. I mean, if I showed up every single day for the next year and did something creatively, I mean, something's got to happen. Right. Um, but it terrified me because I thought, well, I haven't done anything for the past 10 years. I haven't been consistent in any amount of stretch. What makes me think I could last seven days or 14 days or a month? Much less a and whole so, year. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah. So, but but I decided, you know what? What do I have to lose at this point, right? Um, and so I went into it very open-handed and I just gave myself almost like some project parameters around some things. And I broke it down into smaller bite-sized um, projects that weren't so daunting of like a year. Plus I thought, you know, I'm experimenting right now. I'm playing, mm -hmm. I'm following some curiosity. And so I need to allow myself the ability to, if I start something and I'm not really feeling it, that I don't push myself or, or let that lack of disinterest force me out of this exercise altogether, mm -hmm. right? I didn't want to abandon my, my overall goal just because of a project or something I was involved with. So I started to do this every day. I blew off the dust on my, my sketchbook. I started with this really awful Starbucks coffee cup day one. And um, it was it was horrible. It was it was really, really a bad rendering <laughs> in five minutes with a pen. And I thought to myself, man, this is my capacity at this point. Ooh, that hurts. And if anybody knew I went to art school and was looking over my <laughs> shoulder, they'd be like, dude, what happened to you? Like, e right. But it was at that moment I really had to to have a conversation with myself to say, this is what I'm able to do right now. 
I have mm-hmm. been away for a long time and I'm coming back and be okay with not perfect, be okay with this wonkiness and this embarrassing drawing. And I wrote at the top of the page day one, and I decided that's day one, I'm closing the book day two, I have a fresh page and I'm going to start mm-hmm. again. And so I knew that it was really more about the journey than it was about the individual pieces that I was creating. Now, over time, of course, the more that you show up for something, the more work you do, the better you get at it. You have to get a lot of bad work out of the way before you get to the good work. Mm -hmm. And so I did all this in the first year and I I came to the end and I was like, okay, I did it. Great. Now what? And I said, I don't think I'm done. I think there's more to learn here and more to, to uncover and rediscover. And that's really what it became was a journey of rediscovery of myself, of my creativity, of things that I didn't even know that I was interested in nor capable of doing. Um, and I just kept setting these these little challenges for myself. And this is all happening as a you know personal journey, right? Mm-hmm. Um, this isn't tied to, again, clients and all these other expectations and stuff. So I had the freedom to be able to decide how I wanted things to look. and. Yeah when I showed up and what materials I used, all those kind of things. And so eventually I found my voice and my style as an illustrator, realized, oh, I'm a mess. Like I like messy things. I like splatter marks. I like loose lines. Lean into that. Stop trying to be so highly, Mm -hmm. tightly rendered. Mm -hmm. Um, I had to expose a lot of lies, I believed, way back from art school and the comparisons um, and really own myself in this process. And so the more that I did that, the more I realized, wow, this is incredible. I started doing better work. I started seeing some opportunity. And then the next level of that, as I kept going, was, oh, this isn't just for me. This journey is actually for all creative people. Like everybody that I know who's creative goes through some kind of season like this or wrestles with a lot of these same issues. And there are a lot of people who are still sitting on the sidelines going like, I don't know that I can re-engage with this, or I don't mm-hmm. know that I can do this even though I want to. I don't, I don't know where to even go to start. And so I started to identify some things along my journey that were just mile markers, right? Uh-huh. Principles and saying, okay, if I can put some language around this and put together a framework that I can help walk people through based on my own experiences, then that helps people have a clear path. And so that's where daily creative habit came out. It was my own experience that I put into that framework. And now I have resources that I provide and I speak about these things and I just come alongside fellow creative people, regardless of whatever their creative expression is Mm -hmm. and say, look, it is possible. Because if it's possible for me, it's possible for anyone. Um, And so that's why I love doing this. And that's why, you know, creativity honestly saved my life and doing it every single day, doing something creative keeps that part of me alive. That's so awesome. I I love that story. And there's a few things I want to poke at Mm -hmm. with you too. One is how you went from these different extremes of being in a, in a design job where, where what you, what used to be kind of joyful and pleasurable and, and, and energizing to you became mundane. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I hear that a lot. People are worried about how to balance doing what they love for, for their job. And will Mm -hmm. it become tedious and will it become mundane? to completely going the opposite direction where you were doing fulfilling work, but not in your artistic passion area Mm -hmm. and how that, how too much of either of those things was not fulfilling for you in the long run. And so I'm curious now, how do you, how do you, in what you do today get, how have you found that balance of what you need individually so that all your pieces are happy? Yes. Uh, And that's a great question because I had to go through those experiences to have context and understand and make the mistakes. Honestly, a lot of people think, especially when you're employed for your creativity, that that's the goal is to have employment, to get paid for your creativity. Once that happens, I'm golden. This is great. 
But what happens is so often you get into a position where there are outside expectations and there mm-hmm. are things that you have to do that you wouldn't necessarily do and you don't quite own everything. Um, you're a part of a process and you contribute, mm-hmm. but there's still that part of you that wants to do something that has your fingerprints all over it, where you just get to express or be curious or play, experiment. And the trap that happens is that people who are using their creativity all day long for somebody else, they come home and think, well, the last thing I can do is have energy and ability to create stuff for myself now. Right. I've been, I used it all up, it's, it's gone for everybody else. And so they get stuck in this cycle and this low grade frustration that happens where they're thinking this is broken because Mm -hmm. all day long i'm yes i'm creating yes i'm getting paid for it but i'm not feeling fulfilled i'm not feeling like what i'm doing is really making a difference and then they think well what i need to do is actually just chop it off and do go do something else or go to a different company or go and really what happens is the cycle just repeats itself again yeah, and again because you've way. never exactly you've never gotten to that place where you're going i'm investing in myself personally in this creative journey everything that i do has to do with professionally and you need that place you need you need the place where something is just yours where mm-hmm. there's no clients there's no committees there's no you bring yourself to it and you figure out what you want it to look like because that's the place where you have some freedom that's the place where you have some yeah. play and yeah. to try to shackle the, the the career with that expectation of this is going to fulfill all my creative needs mm-hmm. it's just not going to happen and so that's why it's it's an and both not an either or yeah and so for myself over time i've realized that like oh even when i have client work there are things that are being informed by the things that are happening for me personally in my yep. creativity i'm yep. making discoveries and breakthroughs on things where the stakes are lower but it's still energizing me because we're we're not these segmented beings that mm-hmm. where pieces don't overlap we 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 sometimes solve problems in areas that are outside the constraints of when we're supposed to solve the problem, right? Yeah. It's the whole thing of like, you get those ideas in the shower. Yep. You're not on the clock in the shower, right? But yep. ideas are happening and yep. you're bringing that back to when you're trying to solve a problem in the workplace or professionally, wherever. And so to have that more balanced approach where you can be more of a holistic, creative person yes. is really the goal. Yeah. And to not go, I'm off the clock now. My creativity was left at the job and now I'm home. Now I'm with family. Now I'm with friends. Now I'm doing my own thing. And it has nothing to do with creativity. That just doesn't exist. Yeah. We're, we're always creative. And so pay attention to that. And more than pay attention, have agency over that. Because when you have agency over yourself in that way, that's when things start to happen that would never happen otherwise. That's when you have breakthroughs and revelations and you yep. have these rediscoveries and you lead to solutions that you would never come to because you're starting to do things that you've never done before. Yeah. Trying things differently and creating new neural pathways in your brain. I it's so it's so important. And I want to talk for a minute about creativity and trying new things and things that are challenging because I know a lot of people associate creativity with the arts Mm -hmm. and they don't believe that they are artists or creative in an artistic way. And I still ask them to draw Mm -hmm. when I facilitate sessions. And I want to kind of touch on two things and then, and then get your reaction to them. One is what you were talking about in your story about how even though you had gone to art school, when you came back to start sketching again after taking a 10-year break, how difficult that was and how you felt like your skills had waned and how judgmental you were. You tried not to be, but you were judgmental <laughs> of the drawing that, you know, that you did on day one, yeah. right? And a huge part of what I do when I facilitate workshops where I ask people to draw is be their, their therapist and their, <laughs> their cheerleader uh, and, and try to get them to understand that drawing is like any other skill, any other muscle. If you don't use it, you lose it and it doesn't progress. So most people stop drawing when they're in elementary school 
And so that's right. where their skill level remains. Mm -hmm. But it is something that anyone can get better at. And, and yes, you do have to find your own artistic style and, and kind of skill. And so not everyone's will look the same. Mm -hmm. um, but it's possible to get better. And it will help you in more ways than just being able to draw or play Pictionary. Right. It's like we, what we were just talking about, doing different creative activities makes more connections in your brain and helps you see things differently in ways that are completely unexpected. Mm -hmm. So drawing, doing things with your hands, building things, other hobbies like that will help you in the workplace, will help you in your life, will help you be a more curious, creative problem solving person. Those are two things that jumped out to me when you yes. were telling your story, because yeah. it's, um, people have a lot of baggage around illustration, <laughs> around drawing a lot, oh, totally. a yeah. lot. Yeah. Well, yeah. And, and the thing is, you know, I'm glad you brought that up about most people think well, creativity is just the obvious expressions of the arts, mm -hmm. so to speak. Drawing, painting, dance, music, you know, those kind of things, performance. And they're like, well, I don't do any of those things, so I'm not creative. And I'm like, no, we need to redefine what creativity is here. Because, yes, those are expressions of creativity, mm -hmm. but you can be creative in how you organize things. Yeah. In how you cook a meal and how you decorate a home. It could be in a million different ways how creativity can show up in your life. It's just identifying how that looks for you personally and not comparing it to the person next to you. And that's where sometimes my visual arts background is actually a liability because people very easily can say, well, you know, sure, you can say these things. Sure, you can have a daily creative habit because look, you went to art school. Look, you're, you're it's mm -hmm. built into you. You've been in since you were a kid, like all that. And I'm like, well, that's, that's my context. It's my journey, but you have one too. It's yeah. just a matter of, are you paying attention to it? And are you leaning into it on purpose? Mm -hmm. And so I think that's really where I like to bring the conversation and not so much centered on specifically the, the creative activity, but getting people to think more broadly about creativity mm -hmm. and then trying those activities and saying, yeah, okay, maybe drawing isn't your thing, but what do you got to lose of just Try it. And maybe mm -hmm. if this is something you have an interest in, realize that, yes, you can develop it. Like you said, it's a skill and a muscle to be developed. Um, and also you, you had mentioned something else in there too, that reminded me of like this process of creating and then also revising and editing, right? Mm -hmm. It's so important that we talk about dividing those times because too often when we're creating things, we're judging it immediately. Uh -huh. And we're saying, oh, this doesn't have value because what I see in my head and what I see on the page, completely different worlds same. apart. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the product that I have developed here is lacking. So therefore, there must be something wrong with this process. And therefore, I'm, I'm just, I'm out. This isn't working. I can't do this. Those, those are the stories we tell ourselves. And so I think it's much more healthy to, even if you, you know you're a creative person, you know that you're talented, whatever, like to have this creation process without the the voice of judgment as you're executing and then revisit it at a mm -hmm. separate pass and go yeah. okay now let me look at this objectively so that i can make it the best i can so that maybe these are ideas that aren't worth pursuing but these other ones are where i need to focus my efforts um it's the same thing like writing uh, you know so many people they're editing as they're writing and they never get fully engaged with the process and it's become such a struggle because they keep typing everything and then second guessing and then mm -hmm. deleting and they're spending hours and hours of time and they have very little to show for it and so i think having that mentality of creating and revising and editing two different processes um don't mix them because that will give you a lot of frustration yeah and not forcing it either if you're not feeling the inspiration it's okay to take a break and come back again later go take a walk take a shower work out do something completely different and then come back um because the results will be better <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. yeah 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 um 
So I wanted to talk a little bit more about what kinds of, well, <laughs> first let's, first I want to come clean about something and that this is not our first <laughs> <laughs> first conversation that we had we tried to record this podcast uh two weeks ago about mm -hmm. yep. and uh we had some user error <laughs> <laughs> we learned some things about zoom together mm -hmm. um and i i share that because the creative process and the learning process is messy and we always try to present ourselves as being this perfect, polished professional. And I am grateful that you're you were willing to be messy and be a good sport and come <laughs> back and do this again. Um, and I I just wanted to kind of ask you, what role do you see accidents as having in your in your art? work hmm. yeah so first i, I want to say too yeah like i agree with your assessment of, of just being a little more vulnerable in the mess um because too much of our world today postures and shows only the best and i get that there's a place for that when you're showing your portfolio of work mm -hmm. or something or there's other contexts great i believe in that wholeheartedly but I think when you are willing to show a little behind the scenes or just be like, you know what, this happened and this happens to other people too. I think it makes you more relatable because no one wants to really hang out with the person who just always seems to have everything going right and always seems to, <laughs> everything lines up, right? Like that's frustrating to be around those kind of people. Um, and the truth of that is that that really isn't anybody, but that's what they show. Mm -hmm. And so I always lo love to lead with vulnerability and empathy and let that be another connection point. So <clears throat> totally on board. Um, but in terms of um, accidents, you know, there's there's two thoughts here. One, after something has happened, I really don't try to be too attached to what happens, even if it's something that is really painful or a loss or just mm -hmm. a season, you know. Um, I try to examine it and say, how can this be redeemed mm. and hold that point of view? Because if there's redemption in it, there's finding some good, there's finding some possibility out of what happened that you can't change. It happened. And so it doesn't make excuses. It doesn't, um, it doesn't lessen sometimes the, the painful situations that you, you had to go through. But if you can find some value in it for yourself, and then also for me, it's offering it to other people. Um, I try to be very open handed about that stuff. That's why I talk about depression. That's why I talk about some of the things that, that have happened on my journey that most people would not want to talk about and just pretend it never happened. I see those as opportunities to connect and help somebody else. And so that brings redemption to those kind of accidents, if you will. Um, and then in terms of like when you're working and there's kind of an accident type thing happening and you're like, oh, well, that didn't happen the way I thought it would. I welcome those things as well, because I think sometimes, you know, it's, it's the, you know, the Bob Ross, you know, the happy accidents, um, <laughs> this, this turns into something that I wasn't planning on, but it presents an opportunity. And most of the things that I've done, like my, the first book that I, I illustrated and authored, um, Dear Snow, One Man's Angry Rant Against Winter. It's kind of my, my uh, I'd say, biography about um, how much I hate snow in winter. And so <laughs> that came about, it was an accident. It was, it started with a bunch of angry tweets, honestly, when I was shoveling snow and I was just like, you, are you kidding me? The, the plow came down again and, and filled me in. I just shoveled out. Ah! You know, it, it was one of those moments. And I just was like, I have to do something with this angst. So I tweeted it. And then I realized like, oh, I was doing this a lot. And people started going like, this is funny. What are you going to say next? And whatever. I'm like, oh, thank you for, you know, validating my pain. And uh, <laughs> I just leaned into that and said, yeah, like, let me turn this into a book. And so um, those things happen by accident a lot of times. Uh -huh. it's, it's looking at it afterwards or looking at it in the moment and saying, 
where's their value? I didn't plan this, but this is what I have to deal with. And so accidents can equal possibility. Especially when you have a sense of humor about it. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Um, Mike, I like to end these uh, chats with a challenge for the listeners. So I'm wondering mm -hmm. if you have a challenge for the folks listening today. Yes, I would say what I say a lot on my on my podcast, I say go create something. And I think too often we believe we need to have huge blocks of time. We need to have all the right materials, you know, the stars need to align for us to actually get ourselves in gear and create something that's of worth. And my journey has taught me to not underestimate what you can do in 5, 10, 15 minutes a day and what that does collectively over time because the consistency of that mm -hmm. will do more than one weekend twice a year where you show up and try and create some masterpiece. Um, and so, and I say create something because if we lower the bar enough to be open, we can make some of those discoveries and we can allow ourselves to follow our curiosity without being so tied to a specific outcome. And if we miss the mark on that outcome, again, we want to walk away from the whole process. Um, that's what I talk a lot about in, in the daily creative habit email newsletter that I send out. And also I have um, a, a creative journal that's available for, to help set intention for people and then take action. Mm -hmm. And that's really what it's all about is just start doing something, start creating. It's movement because when you start to do something, when you take action, then clarity comes, then skill develops, then opportunities come. Don't wait for all these things to fall into place beforehand because it doesn't work that way. So get moving because that's when you'll start to see things happening. Just get started. Exactly. And if you need prompts, I believe you send out prompts too, right? Yes, yes. Yep. Through uh, the Daily Creative Habit email newsletter. If you go to dailycreativehabit.com, you'll see a host of resources that I've created for people there. Um, that's free. There's also a, uh, like I said, the Daily Creative Habit journal that's available through Amazon right now. And um, that gives you a 90 day journey where you're setting an intention in the morning saying, here's what I want to create. Here's what when I'm going to do this, what it's going to look like. And at the end of the day, it's like five minutes, just review of, did I do what I said I was going to do? And what did that look like? What did I learn today? And so it, it gives you a, um, a system to employ so that it helps you show up. It helps you track and measure. It helps you set intention and then take action and reflect to go, oh, I did some things. What does that look like? How can I celebrate? Because um, I think it's really important that we have those rhythms built into ourselves so we don't have this sense of like, I'm creating things, but I don't really know what that looks like or if it's leading any place or if I'm really growing or mm -hmm. what's happening. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's an important part of um, the journey as well. Thank you so much. Absolutely. My pleasure.